Good morning and welcome. Let's read from the scriptures in Daniel chapter 6 and verses 10 to 28. It's the second half of what we looked at last week. Daniel chapter 6 and verses 10 to 28. I remember last week there was this amazing idea that if you did, if you prayed to anyone except the king, you'd be thrown in the den of lions. And when Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Then the, <coughs> these men came by agreement and found Daniel, making petition and plea before his God. They came near and said before the king, concerning the injunction, O king, did you not say, sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. The king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel, and he laboured till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. A stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then at break of day the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish, the king declared to Daniel, O oh Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O oh king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before you, and also before, sorry, before him, and also before you, O oh king. I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of harm was found on him because he had trusted in his God. Then the king commanded and those who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. Then Darius wrote to all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my dominion people are to tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall have no end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Amen. Excuse me. Well, 
Let's pray. Mighty God and loving Heavenly Father, thank you for that reading from your word, a piece of history recorded for us to learn lessons. And Lord, we pray that you will speak to us this morning, teaching us the things we need to know, helping us to remember who it is that we serve. We serve the Almighty God, who can do all things. The only thing you cannot do is deny what you have promised, and you have promised never to leave nor to forsake your people. And we ask, Lord, that we will remember that when we find ourselves in situations which we do not like and are scared of. Lord, thank you for keeping us and giving us health and strength in the midst of this pandemic. And thank you that it would appear that the tide of the pandemic is receding in this country, and we praise you for that. And Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world where there is still tremendous danger. And we ask, Lord, that you will keep and encourage your saints and enable them to shine as lights in the darkness, to be stable in the midst of fear and panic, that the gospel may be proclaimed by their lives, if not by their words. Indeed, Lord, we pray that we may be salt in our society, that we may be light in the darkness of this world, that your name may be glorified through your church. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering because they love you, those who live in places like Daniel where it is illegal to serve you and the authorities persecute vigorously those who ignore them on that point. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters who suffer because they love you, that they may know the joy of your salvation, the peace that passes their understanding, keeping their hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And through their steadfast witness, Lord, we pray that their persecutors may come to a knowledge of the truth. Lord, we ask for ourselves. You know the hearts and minds of each of us. You know the things that trouble us. You know the things that encourage and help us. We pray, Lord, that you will minister to us today, easing our burdens, directing our way, convicting us of our sins, drawing us closer to yourself and granting us the encouragement of your presence. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So, I want to look this morning at the text, or rather the subject, Blameless Before God, and the text, Daniel 6, verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Now, the story of Daniel, as you probably noticed when we read it, is kind of satisfying. All the baddies get what they deserve. The king realizes his folly and ends up commanding everyone to respect God. And verse 28 is really pretty close to they all lived happily ever after. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius. I suppose that could be Darius, take your pick. And the reign of Cyrus the Persian. In practical terms... This is one of those occasions where making a stand about a foolish law, which is what we looked at last week, proved to be a great blessing. A huge blessing, actually. It always is a blessing when people stand up for what is right, but it's not always quite so obvious as this. And it was a blessing to the rest of Daniel's people, the rest of the Jews. It must have been very perplexing to them to suddenly discover that they were banned by law from praying. And then Daniel changed things almost immediately. By the end of the next day, the king is actually commanding everyone to respect and pray to their God. The, uh, the king now has um, positively encouraging worship of God and understanding that God is actually God, 
goes with the title. He rules over all things. He does all things uh, according to his own will. Uh, and it was, I say, a great encouragement. You know, being faithful is a great encouragement. You, you may not realize this, but just think how positively discouraging it is when somebody you thought was a Christian does or says things which are unchristian. And that is so discouraging. So it works the other way around too. People are watching you. So if you behave according to your faith, they will be encouraged or challenged according to whether they are Christian or not themselves. But anyway, this is a great story, and it all works out, and it's lovely. But as our brothers and sisters in China and many other parts of the world know, the usual thing is that the lions bite. It is extremely rare for rulers of lands that um, dislike God to suddenly be impressed by people who put God's law above theirs. Doesn't usually happen. In fact, Jesus warned us in Matthew 10, 16 to 18, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in their synagogues. You will be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. Persecution will come, and it usually will hurt. It's not often people escape by a miracle. You remember there was James, who was imprisoned and beheaded. There was Peter, who was imprisoned, but was released by an angel. So, either can happen, but it's not guaranteed. So, our text. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths, and they have done me, have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him, and also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Now, is this Daniel standing on his soapbox and saying, hey, look at me, I'm perfect, and because I'm so perfect, the lions couldn't touch me? No, it is not. And do we think that James was not such a good guy because he got beheaded and Peter was great because he didn't? No, that is not what we're saying. Our text is Daniel's testimony. The lions didn't hurt him because he was not guilty before God. Now, we had a similar thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. You remember the flames didn't touch them because they were not guilty. Daniel 3, verse 28. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and delivered his servants who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. It's our usual experience, however, that if you get chucked into a fire, you burn. The Christians usually suffer. Nowhere does the Bible indicate that we should expect not to suffer. So let's consider this. The um, subject, blameless before God. The text, as you know, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths. They have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. And I want to look at lions. That's the animals, not the corner house where they served coffee in the dim and distant past. Law of man and the law of God. Lions. 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 8 and 9. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. The devil. The devil is trying to consume Christians. 
Physically, of course, when Peter was writing this, the Romans were throwing Christians to the lions for the amusement of Nero and friends practically every day. And they were literally being eaten. But I'm not actually sure of this. Any of you who are really good at this kind of thing, please tell me afterwards. I have a sneaky suspicion that lions are quite well-mannered. They don't speak with their mouth full. So if you have a roaring lion, he's not eating you. And that is so important to remember. The devil is a roaring lion. He's not eating you. He's trying to scare you silly. But frankly, a roaring lion, a bit like a thunderstorm actually, it's just a noise. You want to be scared of the lightning, not the thunder. You want to be scared of the bite, not the roar. So, roaring lion, not eating you. So Peter's exhortation is to resist the roaring lion. How do you fight a lion? Well, run away if you can. But when Peter's talking about resisting the devil, you resist him firm in the faith, like Daniel did. The lions couldn't touch me because... I wasn't sinning. Our text. My God has sent his angel to shut the lion's mouths. They have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him. God. Blameless before God. Resist the devil by being blameless before God. Obvious. The devil is trying to frighten you into sinning. And you resist him. <laughs> by trusting God and not sinning. And trusting God does make us perfect, blameless before God. How does it do that? Well, Romans 8 verse 1. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Trusting the Lord Jesus Christ as your saviour, trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to forgive your sins, <coughs> no condemnation, blameless before God, Devil can't touch you. So, no condemnation. So we've got to separate the problem here. Because there are obviously two strands which you can't get tangled up, otherwise things get uh, a bit messy. On the one hand, there is the physical danger and pain which the devil tries to make as scary as he can. You know what it's like, you've got toothache, you go to the dentist, what do you think about? Getting rid of the pain or the extra pain the dentist is gonna produce? You know, we, we tend to be scared of the idea of <coughs> being hurt. Well, I do anyway, I don't, you, you lot may be much bolder than I am, but we don't like getting hurt. And the devil plays on us possibly getting hurt hurt. So that's the roaring lion trying to scare us into sinning or doing something silly. On the other hand, there's the glorious spiritual fact that whatever happens to your physical body, if you are trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ, the devil cannot touch you. You are more than your body. You are a living soul. Child of God, if you're trusting Jesus, and the devil can't touch you. He cannot consume a person who is blameless before God. Somebody who is trusting Jesus cannot be touched by the devil spiritually. 1 Corinthians 15. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labour is not in vain. Hold on. Total victory over the devil and all his works through the Lord Jesus Christ, who said in Matthew 10, verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body that cannot kill the soul. Rather, 
fear him who can destroy both body, soul and body in hell. And there's a couple of different words there. Well, I'm not sure whether they're different words, but definitely different meanings. Fear those who kill the body is don't be scared of them. But rather fear him who can destroy both in hell, God. That means reverence, worship. Worship and serve God. Total safety for eternity. Because life actually is knowing God. Not being physically animated. So lots of things are alive who don't know God. And they die when it makes no difference. But if you are alive in knowing God, then you have eternal life. Joy and peace in the midst of sorrow. Because you are blameless before God. Not because you're goody, but because you're trusting the Lord Jesus Christ to take away your sin. So that's the lions. So how about the law of man? The fact is, those who suffer persecution are not blameless according to the law of men. That's the whole point of persecution. They make a law which makes our worship of God illegal and then punish us for worshipping God. That's, that's what you do. The law of man, however stupid and unreasonable it is, it is the law. And Daniel had broken it. Quite deliberately broken it, as we, as we read. And the same is true for us. If they were to make a law in this country forbidding us to read the Bible, I would totally ignore it, as would all Christians. If they were to make a law in this country forbidding us to worship God, we totally ignore it. Okay, we might go into hiding, we might try and avoid it, uh, avoid being seen or whatever, but we would ignore the law. And if they caught us, then we'd be guilty. And you notice that Daniel makes absolutely no protest about his sentence. He knew what the sentence was when he prayed three times a day. And when the sentence came, he didn't comment. The king did. He ought to have known what the sentence was. He wrote it, but Daniel didn't. It is part of our Christian duty to honour those in authority. And that means to accept the consequences of breaking their laws without complaint, as Jesus did. 1 Peter 2, 20. What credit is it if when you sin you are beaten for it and you endure but if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a glorious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Looked at from a legal point of view, in spite of the farce of the trial and a few other things, Jesus was properly condemned by the Roman authorities and he suffered accordingly. And he made no comment on the subject. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. And that's what we must do. To be blameless before God, and to do the king no harm, we must honour the king's laws by ignoring them, if they go against God's laws. <laughs> you see, there are two ways that Daniel could have done the king harm. The most obvious one would have been to have held his stupid law up to ridicule and undermined his position. That he did not do. Jesus didn't do that. We shouldn't do that. The real way that he could have harmed the king would have been to have obeyed him. What kind of a message does it send to the ungodly 
when all they have to do is wave a big stick and Christians suddenly abandon their God and do what they say. What kind of a God is that? <clears throat> Look at what the king says. He, he says everyone should tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed. His dominion shall have no end. He delivers and rescues and so on. The king would have never found out any of that if Daniel had tamely done what his silly lord told him to do. So the biggest harm that could have been done would have been to have conformed to the pressure of society. As Jesus said in Matthew 5 verse 13, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how should its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. And if you look around, read the newspaper headlines occasionally, the newspapers are absolutely scathing about Christians who abandon their Christianity and do as they're told. They triumph over them. They, they ridicule them. Look at the way Christianity is so often portrayed on uh, television programs and things. It's a joke. Why? Because the Christianity they are portraying long since gave up the Bible and is just a do good in good works PC society. It's not godliness. So, Daniel, did the king no harm because he stayed just where he was, preaching the gospel by his actions, that God is over even the king of the Medes and the Persians. And God's law is more unchangeable even than the law of the Medes and Persians that cannot be changed or revoked. And really, the same is true of us. The greatest harm we could do our godless nation and society is to stop preaching the gospel. Think about it. If you stop preaching the gospel, you are basically saying you consider everybody around you to be not worth saving. You hate them. They can rot in hell for the rest of eternity and you don't care. Now, we wouldn't put it that way. <coughs> but to escape danger, to escape pain, if we stop preaching the gospel, we are basically saying we don't care about our persecutors. And also you're saying you don't care about yourself because Jesus said whoever denies me, I will deny so, the only way to escape eternal damnation is trusting in Jesus, and Jesus commanded us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us, so we have no option if we are to stay blameless before God and to do the king no harm, we stick fast to the truth of God's word. We are like Daniel. Matthew 5, verse 48, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. There's just no way that uh, ungodly government is going to call God's people blameless because we will break their ungodly laws. Simply by existing we are an offence. But Contrary to the pressure of the world, the fact is, we do no harm. I have done the king no harm. Living according to God's law, doing what the Bible says, will not hurt anybody. It will offend them, doubtless. And these days they've even managed to make giving people an offence uh, breaking the law. But, you know, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. It can be very painful if somebody offends you. I'm not trying to diminish the, the sorrow that that causes, but it doesn't actually harm the state to have a lot of obedient, good citizens quietly getting on with a godly life.
The thing is, <coughs> telling people the truth is not a hate crime. It's love in action. If, and this is a big if, don't ignore this if, if love is our motive. Mm -hmm. There are some people who tell people the truth and it's got barbs all over it. That's not love. But if love is the motive for telling people the truth, then it's love in action. God's love in action. And it will do no harm. In 1 Corinthians 13 verse 3, Apostle Paul says, If I give away all that I have, deliver up my body to be burned, become a martyr, but have not love. I gain nothing. Love must motivate us. Then we are blameless. And third point, we keep the law of God. The law of God obviously includes an awful lot of rules. Thou shalt not do this, that or the other. It also includes a lot of things we should do. Don't bow down to idols. Do keep the Sabbath day and worship God. You know, it's all there in Exodus 20. And people tend to think that Christianity is just a bunch of rules. And some people even think that they're Christians because they keep a bunch of rules. You could program a robot to keep rules. That doesn't make it a Christian. The law of God, as James says in James 2 verse 8, if you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength and your neighbor as yourself. The first is, loving your neighbor is the first fruit of loving God. God is love. Uh, this is in Matthew 22, 37 to 40. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first command. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Everything in scripture is summed up in those two. And as John points out in 1 John 4 verse 8, Anybody who does not love does not know God because God is love. And then in verse 20 and 21 of the same chapter, anyone who says I love God and hates his brother is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. So, for us to be blameless toward God, we must be loving toward others. I've already said this, but it's worth repeating. There is just no possibility that Darius would have ever seen the folly of his laws and the greatness of our God if Daniel had not risked his life to show him. There is no possibility that you would have ever heard the gospel if somebody hadn't taken the time to tell you. And if you're in some countries in the world, that means somebody actually risked their life to tell you. It's all too easy to be self-piteous and to resent the evil of unbelievers and to treat our persecutors as our enemies and to hate them. But that's just what we would be if we didn't know God. They're no different. Everybody who walks in darkness can't see because they're in the dark. And we would be the same if we were in the dark. I, I've often thought, you know, people go through old bits of history and they look at some of the terrible things that have been done by people in time of war and persecution or whatever, and they say, oh, I could never do that. Well, praise the Lord if they couldn't, but frankly, I'm pretty sure I could put in the right circumstances. We're human. Love is so much more than keeping a bunch of rules. 
Love will make us keep God's law. Of course it will. We love him and we want to please him. But in our rigid tradition, we'll also keep God's law rigidly. Dead orthodoxy. It's of no value. Loving heart seeks to glorify God, as Peter says in 1 Peter 4, verse 8. Loving one another earnestly covers a multitude of sins. Just think about that. If you really love somebody and they really do something that's really quite painful, you forgive them. You don't even notice it sometimes. Somebody who you love comes up and says, oh, I'm really sorry, I did so and so and such and such. You think, oh, did you? Sorry, I didn't notice. Because you love them. You make allowances. It doesn't keep a record. It doesn't take offence. And we must do that with our neighbours. Covers a multitude of sins. We really must expect the devil's slaves to do the devil's bidding. They don't have a choice. Those who do not know the Lord Jesus Christ are not free to do their own will. They are bound to obey the will of the devil. Okay, they want to do it. They're not consciously slaves, but they don't have a choice. They can't do the will of God. They are bound slaves to Satan. But we're free. You notice that. Christians have got a choice. We can do God's will, or we can do the devil's. We've got a choice. That's what freedom is. It's you can choose. So we should pity those who are bound, same as we pity those who can't see when you can. And give them a hand. Love them. Love for God, keeping his commandments. And out of love for God, loving our neighbours like ourselves. Then, whatever happens to our physical body is really quite irrelevant. Because like Daniel, we will be able to say, I have not been harmed because I am blameless before you. And I have done no harm to my neighbour. May God help us. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for the challenge that it brings to us. Lord, thank you that we have a gospel to proclaim and that we know through the Lord Jesus Christ we are free. Free to serve you, free from the condemnation of sin and free to preach the gospel to every creature. Lord, help us to use our Christian freedom and to love you more to serve you better and to be more earnest in our communications with our neighbours of their need of the Saviour. Father, please forgive and take from our minds anything that's been amiss and seal to our hearts this message. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. <coughs>